Hello, everyone. I'm James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk. And this program and all the others that you hear on this broadcast was produced by the James Dobson Family Institute. And thank you for tuning in today and for your support, especially at this time of the year. People are always surprised to learn that I love Beatle music. And I've tapped my foot to it since 1964 when the Beatles first broke on the scene. The individual Beatles had a terrible godless impact on their generation. You know, they promoted marijuana and all kinds of hard drugs and womanizing and profanity and other things. But their music was unlike anything ever written. And one of their most popular songs was entitled, All You Need Is Love. All you need is love. You recognize it, but not from my voice. Well, uh, love isn't all you need uh, because you need a little more than that. But the Fab Four, as they were called, might have contributed to the confusion. Uh, Today, we're going to take a hard look at love, courtesy of Bob Lapine, who has just written a book on that subject entitled Love Like You Mean It. And uh, the subtitle is The Heart of a Marriage That Honors God. Bob has been the co-host of Family Life Today for 26 years uh, on the radio, and uh, the program is still on. In fact, I'm going to ask Bob to give us an update on it uh, when I finish my introduction. Bob is now a pastor and the announcer on the Alexander Begg program. He's still working with Family Life Today, obviously. Uh, the bank program is entitled Truth for Life. Uh, Bob also has uh, a responsibility on the board of directors of the National Religious Broadcasters. He's married to Mary Ann, and they have five children, and uh, we're delighted to have him with us. Bob, welcome to Family Talk. Dr. Dobson, it is a, uh, an honor to be with you. Thanks for the invitation. Tell me about family life today. You are still... Uh, serving as the co-host of the program, but uh, Dennis Rainey has now retired. Is that right? Yeah, there was a transition that took place um, about two years ago as Dennis stepped away from being president of Family Life and from his responsibilities on Family Life today. He and Barbara continue to write and do ministry and uh, work on projects. They've got a a website called therainies.org that they uh, operate and are continuing to be vital in ministry. Uh, I, I have stayed here with Family Life as co-host of Family Life today with our new hosts, Dave and Ann Wilson, and mm-hmm. uh, our audience is getting introduced to them and getting to know them, and, and the response to their ministry has been very gratifying from our listeners. So, uh, you know, we, we've been looking at how we can continue the vital work of Family Life for another generation, and uh, that's what we're hoping will happen through the work of Family Life today. Well, I wish you would give our love and regards to Dennis and Barbara. They have been on this program and on Focus on the Family when I was there uh, many times, and I have great love and respect for them and the work that they do. Well, I can assure you it is mutual love and respect. We we have talked many times about our, our uh, respect for you and our uh, gratitude for your influence in our lives personally and your influence in the work of the church for decades. So thank you for that, Dr. Dobson. Love Like You Mean It is, uh, I believe, your fourth book, isn't it? Yeah, it's a book that I I have kind of stewed on for many years, just recognizing that most people think about love in emotional terms rather than thinking about it, as I like to say, with work boots on. In fact, I was thinking as I wrote the book, I was thinking about your book, Love Must Be Tough, and Mm -hmm. the impact that book had on me as a young man, recognizing that love is an action word. It's not an emotional word. It's something we're called to live out and to know how to do. And sometimes love is hard. Sometimes it has to be tough. And this book is a call to married couples to embrace a more biblical understanding of what love is supposed to be. You and I have a similar uh, pre-marriage experience because 
if I remember correctly, there was a time when Shirley came to you and said, yeah, uh, this is over. We're not going anywhere. Uh, and she dumped you. Marianne dumped me while we were dating as well. Isn't that, well, tr- well, isn't that you, what happened with you? No, you got it backwards. Uh, I'd oh, gone you were with the one certain, who dumped her. Yeah, I'd gone with her for two years. I was about to go into graduate school, and I didn't have any money, and I just didn't see getting married. And I, it was her senior year in college, and I was already out of school, and I was about to go into graduate school, as I said. And uh, I just thought it all over and didn't feel that I was ready to get married, but I didn't want to tie her up. Uh, during her senior year because there would be other guys that would be standing in line for her. And so I cut her loose, and it was the biggest mistake of my life. And by the next (laughs) morning, I knew it. I stayed up all night thinking about having hurt the best friend I ever had. And uh, so from there to marriage was a short journey. Well, here's what I remember from that story. I remember you saying that when you broke it off with her, she kind of took it uh, somewhat coolly and said, well, if that's what you think. She didn't moan or groan, and, and you were a little taken aback by that and found yourself even more attracted to her as she was being broken up with, right? Well, you've got a good memory because uh, it was not till I knew I was free of her that I knew I desperately wanted her, and it often right. works that way. Yeah. And she let me go with such dignity that I immediately thought I'd made a mistake. <laughs> and it is really amazing how that works. I wrote a book yeah. about it called Love Must Be Tough. And I, I remember as I read that book, getting a, a fresh vision of what love is supposed to be. Because I, I think, and, and you've seen this, so many young couples have this idea of love that it's just supposed to be Hallmark movies all the time. And we're supposed to feel a certain way every moment of every day. And that's just not the reality of married love, is it? It doesn't work that way. It's not a feeling. It's a determination. It's a commitment. And uh, you've talked about that. Well, you mentioned the Beatles earlier, and I I do think that popular music and Hollywood movies and the Hallmark Channel, like I said, have all worked together, conspired together to give us this highly romantic uh, idea of love. And the Bible comes along, I think, and corrects that for us and says, love is going to be harder than you imagined. But when you press in to these character qualities of love that are outlined in 1 Corinthians 13, you find a deeper, richer, more satisfying kind of relationship than if all you had was the the whipped cream and the froth of uh, romantic love. And you have based this book on that chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, haven't you? Yeah, I was doing a a sermon series at our church on that passage and just talking about how love is foundational to everything in the Christian life. And as I worked on it, I I sensed the Lord saying to me, you know, you, you talk on the radio regularly about marriage and family. Why don't you apply this passage to the marriage relationship and help couples understand what it means for love to be patient in marriage or for love to be kind in marriage or not keeping a record of wrongs, all of the things that are described in this passage. And I went back to that passage with fresh eyes and I said, there's a lot for husbands and wives to learn here. And that was really the genesis of the book, Love Like You Mean It. Well, reading it, it's obvious that you just got a lot of information out of it. And we want to be talking about that. You say early on in the book that uh, during your early married life, Life, that you had an immature view of love. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, I, I came into marriage thinking, uh, what benefits will I accrue from this relationship? You know, yeah. I, I'm about to to pledge myself to somebody else. So what am I going to get out of this? What What's the good that's going to come my way? And it wasn't long before I recognized that the heart of God for marriage is not for us to be focused on what am I getting out of this? It's more for us to focus on what am I giving in this relationship. Yeah. It doesn't work as a selfish relationship, does it? It doesn't. It, it'll deteriorate. Rather than asking the question, am I happy? And, and even rather than asking the question, is Mary Ann happy? I think the question we need to be asking is, is God happy with how we're living together as husband and wife? And when that's our pursuit, when that's our goal, the, the richness of the reward we receive by making that our focus is just immeasurable. 
Well, that is a wonderful concept, and we want to build on it. Why is love so difficult to understand? You said you came into marriage not fully understanding what it was all about. Uh, I think that's rather typical, and maybe the culture teaches false concepts of love, but we all start out that way. We have to learn how to give. It doesn't come natural to us, does it? No, what comes natural to us is to be self-focused and self-oriented and to be thinking like I was thinking, which is, what will I get out of this and what am I willing to trade in order to get what I want? Between the cultural definition of love and our own innate selfishness, we start off in marriage with wrong thinking about what love in a relationship should look like. And that's where we so desperately need the Bible. We need the Holy Spirit. We need God to redirect our thinking so that we can get his understanding of what love is. I, I think often, Dr. Dobson, of Jesus' statement, greater love has no one than this that he lays down his life for his friend. And that's the the idea in marriage, we're laying down our lives for one another. Bob, I think it's a wonderfully creative thing to look to the creator to define love. That's what you've done essentially, isn't it? I mean, the Bible is his marriage manual. And, And I didn't really realize that. In fact, when I first came to family life back in 1992, I remember a conversation with Dennis Rainey where Uh, He was talking about marriage and family, and he said, are you passionate about marriage and family? And I said, well, I'm passionate about the things of God, and to the extent that marriage and family is on the heart of God, yeah, I'm passionate about that. What I didn't realize at the time is how much marriage and family is on the heart of God, how central it is to how we live out our faith. Of course, you've recognized this for decades and have pointed us in this direction, marriage and family is so integral to everything that God is doing in human history that we need to be getting it right and getting his definition for yeah. for love and marriage right. Hmm. What uh, do you find there is a way of a uh, definition of sacrificial love? What does that really mean day by day by day? Well, I'll tell you a story. I sat down with a young couple who was, I was doing their premarital counseling many years ago, and I asked them on the first night of premarital counseling to write down their definition of love. And what I got back from them that first night was pretty romantic. It was kind of like a cross between Rod McEwen poems and a Hallmark card. And it was sweet, but it wasn't really durable. And by the end of our premarital counseling, uh, they came away with an understanding that I believe that love really does come down to commitment and self-sacrifice. Those are the, the two cornerstones of biblical love, that we're committed to one another to say, whatever happens, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. That's what we said when we vowed, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, sickness and health, Whatever. I'm staying here no matter how hard it gets. I wish a young man and a woman about to get married fully understood the import and the significance of the wedding vows because, uh, I mean, you are committing yourself for life. Uh, Of course, we all know them to have and to hold from this day forward for better or worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health. Uh, to love and to cherish till death do us part according to God's holy law. That is the very definition of commitment. Uh, You stay together. You're committed to each other. That word commitment, I think, is the essence of it. I, I think it's so foundational, and I think it's why we have couples make a vow. I mean, we don't make people take a vow on something that's going to be simple and easy. You take a vow for something that's going to be challenging and tough and where you're going to want to quit from time to time, and the vow is there to keep you from quitting. And that's what this is all about. When, when I'm doing a wedding, I will often say to couples, this vow that you're about to take is not a romantic statement you're making to one another. This is a bold declaration that you expect hard things to come your way. And when they do, you're not going anywhere and you're going to figure out how to work this out. I've said to couples, if I gave you a car the day that you got married and I said, this car is the only car you will ever be able to have for your entire life. 
I said two things would happen. First of all, you would take better care of that car, <laughs> knowing that it's going to have to last you a lifetime. And then the second thing is, when it broke down, you'd take it to the shop and get it fixed, because it's the only car you've got. Mm. And I say with marriage, we need to treat it like it's the only relationship we're supposed to have, and that means take better care of it in the first place. And when it breaks down, because it will, you go get help and you get it fixed. God's grace is available to help couples through the challenges and struggles of marriage if they're both willing to submit to him and surrender to him. But, Bob, what if you marry a clunker? <laughs> well, you'll have to ask Mary Ann because she did. All right. <laughs> you, you know, we all start off as clunkers. We're two selfish, sinful yeah, individuals coming together to form a, a marriage. And, and yeah, that's where God goes to work. In fact, my greatest growth in my relationship with Christ has come through the challenges that I've faced in marriage. Mm-hmm. And, and that's been God's laboratory for making me more like Jesus. Well, let's work our way through some of the concepts of 1 Corinthians 13. Let's start with the word patience. What Mm. does that mean in reality? You know, isn't it interesting that that's where the Bible starts when it says, here's what love is. It is patient. Mm. We would start with love is affectionate or love is endearing, but it starts with patient. And I like the old King James language that says love is long suffering because patience is the ability to to suffer long, to bear up in the middle of all kinds of challenges and all kinds of trials, we patiently endure. And and we need to be quick to say, we're not talking about enduring physical suffering. If somebody is, is experiencing physical abuse, the Bible is not saying, well, you just bear it. What the Bible is saying is that when you face the kinds of challenges that are the irritations and the the annoyances that are going to come with a, a marriage relationship, you, you make the decision ahead of time. Patience is commitment and self-sacrifice in the midst of the, the regular challenges that we face in a relationship. Boy, long-suffering takes the romance out of it, doesn't it? And, and isn't that interesting? Because that's yeah. where Paul starts. The Bible says Jesus patiently endured for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. And I think in marriage, we patiently work through the challenges that we deal with. We suffer through those things because there is a joy on the other side that God has promised us if we will be patient with one another in our marriage relationship. Yeah, it's not at all that the thrill of it all isn't important because it is. Uh, but uh, it's the commitment that undergirds it all, and uh, that's where the permanence, that's the commitment, that's the steadiness that comes from that determination. Whenever Marianne and I are, have done premarital counseling together, I will often say to these couples who are thinking about getting married, I will say, now look, this is going to get hard. This is going to be tough. And Marianne will chime in, she'll say, And it's also going to be wonderful and glorious. And I say, yeah, it is, but it's going to be hard and tough. And she'll say, but don't lose the fact that it's going to be wonderful and glorious. (laughs) It can be both, actually. It can be. And it must be. It's supposed to be. Yeah. Well, then it goes from patience to kindness. What's the meaning of kindness there? Kindness is, is the proactive uh, desire to bless another person. It's more than niceness. Niceness can be polite or we can be friendly toward another person. Kindness is the decision to proactively seek to bless another person. The formula I use in the book is that my goal is your good. So as we start a marriage relationship, we start with that objective that my goal in this relationship is your good, your thriving, your growing, for you to be the person that God causes you to be. And, it, and I think sometimes too, Dr. Dobson, kindness is the, the little things we do for one another in a marriage relationship that we often take for granted. For example, I went to the drawer this morning and opened my drawer and there were clean undershirts in my drawer. And those kind of magically appear there once a week. And and I just, I have to pause from time to time and say, you know, this is an act of kindness on the part of my wife to say, I'm going to serve you in this way and do these little things that are a blessing to you that make life work for you. And I, you indicated in your book that that kind of kindness is the marital disinfectant. Explain that. 
Yeah, it really does wash away a lot of the toxins that can build up in a in a marriage relationship when we do an act of kindness for another person. Marianne was going on a, a, a road trip to see her mom recently, and so she was going to be leaving the next morning, and uh, she had gone to bed, and I got to thinking, I wonder if she had a chance to fill up her car before uh, she would leave the next day, and I went out and checked, and the, the car was half empty, and I thought, well, this will save her a little time. So I just I drove down the street and filled it up and uh, and brought it back in. And so the next morning as she's taking off, she notices that her gas tank is filled up. And there's just something about, you thought about me, you cared for me, you, you did a little thing to bless me. That is the disinfectant, the oil that, that makes the relationship uh, run more smoothly and causes all of the toxins to begin to drain away. It's hard to be mm. uh, frustrated with or mad at somebody who is regularly being kind toward you. Marianne and I were at a Bible study years ago, and the question that we were being asked, all of us were sharing, was what was the last romantic thing your spouse did for you? And I was kind of waiting with some anticipation to see how Marianne would answer that question, because I was trying to think, when have I done anything romantic recently? <laughs> Is she going to have to go back to when we were dating? And so it got to her, and and she said, well, the other night I was in doing the dishes, and without me saying anything, Bob got up and turned off the TV and came and started drying the dishes. And I looked at her and I said, no, honey, they wanted something romantic I had done. <laughs> and she said, that was so romantic when you did that. Yeah. Of course, now, anytime I pick up a dish towel, Marianne looks at me like, I know what you're thinking about here. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go on to the word humility, which is very prominently written in the scripture. Yeah, and, and the Bible says love is not self-seeking. It does not seek its own. That's what humility is. Humility is is this idea that we have the other person's uh, good as our goal and that we are, you know, I, I think a lot of people have a, a false idea about humility. They think it means that uh, that we are supposed to think less of ourselves, and it, it doesn't mean that at all. It means we're supposed to think of ourselves less. So we should have a correct appraisal of who God has made us to be. But instead of thinking of ourselves, we should be thinking of others. That's what Philippians 2 says. Don't merely look out for your own interests, which you are naturally inclined to do, but also for the interests of others. That, that's the mind of Christ that's spoken of in Philippians chapter 2. And that needs to be present in a marriage relationship. Bob, I just looked at the clock. I can't believe it. Our time is gone. It's just uh, fun talking to you about this very important subject. Uh, let's uh, close out the uh, interview today, and let's pick up with it in our next program. Would you be willing to do that? Love to do that. All Thank right. you. Let's, let's summarize. The title of the book is Love Like You Mean It, and uh, the subtitle is The Heart of a Marriage That Honors God. And we'll pick up right here next time. Bob, it's a pleasure talking to you. All those times when Dennis and Barbara have come to Family Talk or Focus on the Family, he didn't bring you with him, and it's, I don't understand that. Man, it's fun talking to you. <laughs> this is a treat for me, so it's, it's an honor and a delight to be on with you today. You've been listening to Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk, and I'm Roger Marsh. You know, we've all heard 1 Corinthians 13 quoted at more weddings than any of us can remember. That's why our eyes might glaze over a bit when we hear the attributes of patience, kindness, and humility articulated as demonstrations of the kind of unconditional love that we should have for our spouse. But think about this for just a moment. Could your marriage use the marital disinfectants, if you will, of patience, kindness, and humility right about now? Bob Lapine is right. Marriage is indeed the laboratory that God uses to make us more like Jesus. 
To learn more about Bob Lapine and his new book, Love Like You Mean It, The Heart of a Marriage That Honors God, visit our broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org. Now, if you want to go back and revisit any part of the program, if you want to hear something again, or maybe you missed a portion listening to it on radio, visit drjamesdobson.org forward slash broadcast, and that way you can hear the program in its entirety. Now, throughout the month of February, we're offering you a copy of Dr. Dobson's book, Nightlight, a devotional for couples. You know, it's important to have regular, quiet moments with your spouse to renew love and intimacy and also to connect with each other and the Lord. The book Nightlight, written by Dr. Dobson and his wife Shirley, will help you do just that. It's a daily devotional that offers the personal, practical, and biblical insights that have sustained the Dobson's marriage for over 60 years. Now, you can receive your copy as our way of thanking you for a suggested donation of $20 or more to the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. For more information on how you can receive a copy of this book, go to drjamesdobson.org forward slash couples. That's drjamesdobson.org forward slash couples. Or you can call us at 877-732-6825. Be sure to join us again tomorrow for part two of Dr. Dobson's conversation with Bob Lapine talking about loving like you mean it in marriage. Be sure to join us again then for the next edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh. Thanks for listening. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.